Hey everyone, today's lesson from Health Ed Solutions is on acute coronary syndrome. Don't forget to visit us online at healthedsolutions.com to certify or recertify your ACLS, PALS, BLS, or NRP 100% online. Now, let's get started. Box 4 to 8, Management of ACS Based on 12-Lead ECG. To guide in the management of patients with ACS, EMS must obtain a 12-lead ECG if this is within their capabilities. The 12-lead ECG should be sent ahead to the receiving hospital. This allows the ED team to triage incoming patients as to whether to prepare for percutaneous coronary intervention, also known as PCI, or fibrinolytic therapy. Being able to make this decision as early as possible minimizes the extent of myocardial injury and reduces morbidity and mortality. 12-lead ECG findings in patients with STEMI. Characteristic ST segment elevation has many descriptions, but using the third universal definition of myocardial infarction from 2012, ST elevation must be seen in at least two contiguous leads equal to 0.1 millivolts or greater, which is at least one small box in all leads except V2 and V3. In women, leads V2 and V3 must have ST segment elevation of greater than or equal to 0.15 millivolts, or one and a half small boxes. For men less than 40 years old, significant ST elevation must be greater than or equal to 0.25 millivolts, or two and a half small boxes. And for men 40 years of age and older, they must have ST elevation of greater than or equal to 0.2 millivolts, or two small boxes. For patients with STEMI or presumably new left bundle branch block, also known as LBBB, who are 12 hours or less from onset of symptoms, the goal is to provide fibrinolytics within 30 minutes of arrival in the ED or PCI within 90 minutes of arrival. While preparing the patient, adjunctive therapies as mentioned in box two and three may be pursued, as long as they do not delay the definitive reperfusion intervention. When complete occlusion of a coronary artery occurs, it can usually be seen as STEMI in the 12-lead ECG of patients with ACS. The gravity of complete occlusion warrants early reperfusion therapy with PCI or fibrinolytics. PCI and fibrinolytics are the mainstay treatment of STEMI patients who are within 12 hours of onset of symptoms. These treatments reduce the risk of mortality and morbidity. They preserve the myocardium, especially when the intervention is done promptly. Studies have shown that if fibrinolytic therapy is given within the first hour of onset of symptoms, there is a 47% reduction in mortality. Hence, providers must minimize any delay in administration of reperfusion therapies. ACLS has described possible choke points that can cause delays, namely door-to-data, data-to-decision, and decision-to-drug, or PCI. Policies must be made in order to prevent these delays. Studies have shown that out-of-hospital transport contributes to only 5% of delays, while ED evaluation causes 25% to 33% of delays. Treatment. Reperfusion therapy for STEMI with PCI. The fourth link in the STEMI chain of survival is the definitive treatment. If PCI will be the treatment of choice, the door to balloon time must be within 90 minutes. If the hospital is incapable of performing PCI, the patient must be transferred to a suitable institution. The time from first medical contact to device must be less than 120 minutes. If fibrinolysis is considered, the door to needle time must be achieved within 30 minutes. PCI utilizes stents to open and revascularize the totally occluded blood vessel. This is the preferred intervention compared to fibrinolytic therapy. Studies have shown that PCI offers greater advantages over fibrinolysis in terms of mortality, stroke, and reinfarction when intervention was given three to 12 hours after the patient first experienced symptoms. Treatment. Fibrinolytic therapy for STEMI. Fibrinolytic therapy is indicated in ACS patients with a significant J-point ST segment elevation MI or with a new LBBB. The success rate where normal blood flow is achieved is observed in 50% of patients undergoing this therapy. 
Fibrinolytic therapy includes the following pharmacologic agents. Recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, or RTPA, retoplase, and tenecteplase. Fibrinolytic therapy must be given within 12 hours from the onset of chest discomfort and when PCI is not available within 90 minutes of first EMS contact. It can also be given in patients with true posterior MI, where the ST segment depression in the precordial leads is equivalent to ST segment elevation in the rest of the ECG leads. Fibrinolytic therapy is contraindicated if the onset of symptoms is more than 12 hours. Treatment Heparin and IV nitroglycerin. Unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin, also known as LMWH, is an adjunct used for PCI and fibrinolytic therapy. Specific high risk situations where heparin may improve the patient's outcome include LV mural thrombosis, atrial fibrillation, and venous thromboembolism for patients who are recommended to have complete bed rest. These must be used with caution as they can cause intracerebral bleeding and hemorrhage. The use of these adjuncts must be guided by an experienced professional. The purpose of IV nitroglycerin is to relieve chest discomfort symptoms in patients with ischemic syndromes, to improve pulmonary edema, and to decrease elevated blood pressure. This mode of delivery is preferred because the dosage can be easily controlled and titrated according to the patient's needs. IV nitroglycerin is indicated in STEMI when the chest discomfort is persistent despite sublingual or spray administration of nitroglycerin. It is also indicated in patients with pulmonary edema that complicates STEMI and can also be used for induced hypertension secondary to complicated STEMI. That's it for our lesson today. Thanks for watching and remember to check out our website at healthedsolutions.com for more free content or to get certified or recertified online.